Jen, this is Bill. Hi. Uh, we're going to talk about a variety of things. So we'll mix it up in uh, uh, phantom messages of uh, the latest project and we're going to share some, uh, uh, some other uh, fascinating cases that uh, fit in nicely with our event today. Uh, phantom messages, uh, we, our focus is on unexpected and uh, unexplained kinds of communication. Uh, so not that you're going out into a haunted house looking for some voices or whatever, but an unexpected answering machine message. Uh, uh, and of course, it has to be uh, seemingly impossible. Uh, and there are a number of uh, different uh, categories we put them in that some consider to, to be time slips on the entities. Uh, aliens uh, and some appear to be people you know uh, who are just bored or there to give you a warning, uh, provide some help. So, uh, or just saying hello. Exactly. And we looked at the uh, characteristics of uh, over 100 cases, especially the, and narrowing it down to what we have in the book, we looked at different kinds of levels of phantom messages. So some happen only once, uh, so they're fascinating, but you know, you can only do so much with them. And others were uh, repeated or had additional characteristics like uh, witnesses, other kinds of evidence. Uh, some were standalone and, and others were part of a larger uh, haunting. Uh, but we wanted to take all of these kinds of messages from the uh, animals of the paranormal Take them out and look at them by themselves. And uh, uh, I think it was about 71% of the ones we looked at had witnesses. But some of the uh, characteristics of the single incident or single witness uh, cases were fascinating because they had commonalities uh, between each other. So, and uh, we're going to start uh, with a phantom message case that actually uh, Jimmy, uh, it was one of his cases. Uh, that actually happened to be subjected to our book. Yes. I have a prepared statement for us. I have a prepared statement. It's an important message. <laughs> Just the other night, I was sleeping under a bridge. And now I am at the grandest city of all the world, having a conference with you fine people. I figure your life's a gift, and I'm intended wasting it. You don't know what hand you're gonna get dealt next. I didn't steal that from any movies, it's my own words. Thank you. Okay, okay so this um, this case was uh, from November of 1996, and we got a phone call to check out this house in Meriden, Connecticut. And the, fam the family's main complaint that their cable box was talking to them. About a month prior, they, uh, I'm going to change their names, but say uh, the Dave, Ann, and the 14-year-old son, Dave Jr., were watching Seinfeld. Uh, the family was having trouble sleeping lately since their 20-year-old 20 20 nephew that lived in Florida, um, he committed suicide a few days earlier. So about 10 minutes into the program, the television started changing channels on its own. Oh, that's interesting. So uh, they figured something's wrong with the cable and just went to sleep. And around the same time the next night, the cable box and television rapidly began switching channels again. The, the mother thought, hey, maybe it's our you know, nephew's spirit trying to communicate with us. At that point, the TV stopped. So the, uh, the father said, hey, if you're a spirit trying to communicate, go to channel 24. The TV immediately changed to channel 24. And this is back in the old days when, if you remember, the cable box just went to zero to 72. Up the machine. And, uh, let's see, it's funny. <laughs> so they got scared, and they put a Bible next to the television and began to pray. Before they finished the first prayer, the Bible was thrown onto the floor. And then again, again they went to bed saying, Let, let's just say it's a cable problem and it's a coincidence that the Bible uh, got thrown to the ground. And tomorrow it would be great. Nope. 
Everything was fine the next day until about 11 p.m. again, when the channels started racing from 72 to 0 over and over again. The 14-year-old son had an idea. He said, let's say that channel 1 is A and channel 26 is Z. The box immediately switched to channels 25, 5, 19, which using that code spelled yes. So the, the father got a pen and some paper, and for the next hour or two, they asked questions out loud, and they would uh, write the question down, and then write underneath all the channels went to, and then they decipher it later. So this is the story that they got. A man claiming to be named Joseph Daniel was murdered in the same apartment they were living in 10 years earlier. The cable box, or Joe as they now call it, told them after his murder, he was rolled up in a carpet and carried out by three men and buried under a porch down the street. He said his uh, murderer, murderer was never caught and he even provided a social security number for them. The cable box will now greet people. Oh, those are pictures. Oh, that's the cable box. Isn't it? It's an actual picture. <laughs> the cable box will greet the family members when they enter the room by their age. So uh, remember, the day of the father was 44. So if he walked into the room, it would change to 44. And when you leave the room, it would flash your age three times, saying goodbye. That's what they understood. So they would even have Joe parties where they'd invite family members and neighbors over, and they'd stand in the hallway and come in one by one, and the, and the cable box would know their age and greet them all. So after a while, they said, Joe, you know, could we help you in any way instead of having parties? And Joe said he would like a proper Christian burial. So uh, Dave called the police department, and he sent an officer out. While the officer was taking the report, it got a bit, you know, a bit awkward when the officer asked where, where they got all this information from, and Dave pointed at the TV. So Dave then asked questions about the officer to the TV. Uh, when was your birthday? What are your children's names? Even his home phone number, which they all would answer correctly. And this was before internet, really, definitely before Google. And it's actually all included in this police report. The officer didn't know what to do, calls for his lieutenant, who was a complete skeptic, and accused the 14-year-old boy of having a hidden second remote, or maybe the upstairs neighbors playing tricks on them, or they just didn't, they said there's no way this is any kind of paranormal. So they did, uh, the, the police department did a follow-up on Joe's story and discovered no one named Joe Dana even lived in the house. No one by that name was ever reported missing. The social security number he provided didn't even exist. So they, uh, they suggested you get your cable box swapped out. So they had, the, <laughs> they had a cable technician come over, and uh, she, she swapped out the box, and they were asking questions to it, and nothing happened. And then they said the, uh, the technician, as she was walking out the door, she looked back over her shoulder and flashed her age three times. But it seemed to quiet down after that. The second box didn't work as well, it seemed. They talked less frequently. Now they were complaining of, of seeing black shadow figures, hearing voices out of thin air, um, while they were trying to go to sleep, they hear talking. During one of our nights investigating the house, um, I was through these dark masses. The, the boys' bedroom seemed to be at the focal point um, that we were trying to focus on, and it, it was the, the hall light was on, so it was gray in the room. We could see these black masses in his room, we were trying to capture them on a uh, you know, video camera. While we're doing that, the, the boy comes running into the room and, and says, it was, it was, it just ran through me. I'm like, what? He goes, a little muscle dude with pointy ears, put his head down, charged at me, hit his head into my stomach, and then the figure disappeared. He said, it burned. And he lifted up his shirt, and it was like a, a frying pan-sized burn mark on his stomach. So we went there a few times trying to capture evidence, and it was our job to point as part of a group where, you know, I'm not in charge, we're just there to try to get evidence and report back. So the dad said, can you, you know, can you please get us some help and, or something? And I said, well, we could, that next time we come over, we could try to do like a, a house blessing for you. We could do something. So the field box really wasn't communicating anymore. 
the, uh, the, the day that we were supposed to come over, he said the cable box um, spelled out, look out tonight, and repeated 66, 66, 66 over and over again. So we're, we're going like, to do a, a little exorcism on the, the home. We brought over you know, exorcism prayers, holy water. Uh, we do the blessed church incense. And uh, Father asked if he could play one of his uh, the Bible on tape. And it was like 20 cassette tapes. And he said, could I play this while you're doing it? I said, is it of course it's your house? Was, which one should I play? I said, I don't know which tape's better than the other. I just pointed to one and said, you know, you want to put this one in. So he had a, you know, one of those big stand-up stereo systems and he, he put the, one of the tape I chose in and it started playing backwards. And anything backwards is creepy, the Bible backwards is extra creepy, I think. So. Oh, and also we checked every other tape that was in the case and all of them perfectly except the, the one I wanted to hear, apparently. So the next morning I called up to see how everything was, if it got any better or worse, and there was no answer. Um, the next day I called, no answer, about a week later. I drove to the house to check on them, and they were gone, moved out, and I never, that everything ends happily, they were just gone, and I haven't found them. When trying to figure out, I'm not saying this is why it happened, but it's a good story, but, um, we interviewed them multiple times, and said, you know, it's kind of odd that we usually try to find out what, when the activity started, if it was did. Do you have a new job? Do you have a new friend? Do you have a new object in the house? Like, why, why did this all of a sudden start? And the son finally admitted to us, the 14-year-old boy, when he went to visit his cousin that lived in Florida that committed suicide uh, earlier, he told us, uh, the, the cousin said, you want to see something cool tonight? So we took him to meet some of his friends in the woods. They all drove their bikes there. And, and the cousin and the friends were wearing robes and, and stood in a large pentagram in a clearing in, a, in the woods and started chanting. And he said he didn't participate, he was just watching. He said they brought out a goat that was uh, tied to a tree, put it in the middle of the pentagram, and sliced its head off with a big sword. They said they saw a yellowish beam of light shoot up from the ground up to the sky. And his cousin said, Wasn't that cool? And I was only next. And I'm going to enjoy your lunch. <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, great. This is, you. This, this is a little different than your regular slide. I actually created these because I liked making these as a kid when I had to do a school project. I actually have these um, on poster boards for smaller venues. But um, I had two what I consider UFO incidents as a child. This one here, I, I can uh, tell you the exact year. It was when Cold Jack the Night Stalker was playing on TV, if anybody remembers that show. So uh, I was a big, I had to listen to Cold Chapel Night Stalker every Friday night. That was why I had to watch it. And one night my mom said, uh, we had to go visit our friends. I said, no, 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 it's Cold Chapel's not tonight. So uh, back in those days, we had this, uh, this weird radio that you could pick up two TV stations on, and you could listen to it anyway. So she goes, oh, we could bring that radio, you could listen to it while we're driving back. So I said, okay, I'll do that. So on the, on the way to our friend's house, we're, we're going over this bridge. Oh, go, go back. This isn't a good, <laughs> this is a good representation. But it's a, this is a highway, and this is a bridge. That's supposed to be a bridge. <laughs> I look over to my right, and there's this silver uh, object. That, this is the best I could find on the internet, so I make it myself the closest thing I could find and I put the red lights on it. But I'd say the, it was like maybe 50 feet in diameter and it was in the air. Um, I don't know how, I don't know how high it was. It was high up, wasn't it? It was over the water though. And it was just doing random, it was just moving randomly. There was no, it didn't seem like there was a pattern to it. it was just randomly flipping in and flipping all around. And it was like every other spike or so had a red light at the end of it. And I was just watching it for a while, and then by the time, I said, this is really, is it, uh, what's Danny Zuko and Sandy from Greece down here? But that was our perspective when I was, we were driving. And I said to my mom, I said, mom, what's that? And by the time 
she turned to look, we were already past it. So um, I didn't have was embarrassed to tell this story for a long time as I never heard of anybody talking about a spiked UFO and then just recently I started talking to some people and I said, no, oh, people have seen those. So I don't know what that was, but I saw that as a kid. What? Yeah, you know. This one here. <laughs> this one here I narrowed it down with 77 or 78, because that's when my dad got picked out I was living at my aunt's house. And he would take us on Sundays. Um, this was another thing that was um, maybe four or five, six o'clock at night, it wasn't dark. Uh, we were going down, if anybody's familiar with them, um, it was like Route 1 in East Haven, Bradford, Connecticut. We, we were driving down the street and then every car started pulling over. Every car was pulled over on the side of the road and everybody was looking up in the air. And there was this thing that, oh, and I was upset because I, I was like, you know, I was a kid and I went to see a flying saucer. And back when I was a kid, I just understood it was either cigar shape or saucer. That was kind of it. So I went to see a saucer and I was kind of upset because there was a cigar one. But this thing, it was so big, it was, I, I, I described it, it was like a football field in the air, like a lit, like Monday Night Football with all the lights and everything. It, and I don't remember the color of the lights, honestly, but it was multicolor. But it was like football field size, and it was going right over the tree line, all the way down the street, really slow, no sound or anything. And it got, I don't know, we watched it for like maybe a mile or so, and then it just zoomed to the left and took off into the sky. When my dad got back to the house, I remember calling the police department immediately, he said, you know, we just saw this thing, everybody was stopped watching it. Um, do you have any idea what it was? I said, it was a blimp. But, but it wasn't. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. I don't know what's next. Mm. Yeah. Come for yeah. 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 It's a big point. Uh, to the uh, Yes, so this came in from, uh, from Israel, uh, and this is, uh, this is ongoing. We still have to uh, interview these guys more, but uh, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Toriello contacted us. He's an Israeli ambassador to, U to the UN. He was talking to Dr. Adrian Klein, and they're members of, of uh, this uh, UFO uh, group, and you know, he's one of the paranormal things like that, and uh, they were having this phone call on, uh, on Skype about, uh, about the UFO research and getting uh, one of their groups, um, I forget what they call it, but it's basically <coughs> accepted by the UN. It didn't shake themselves in time? Yeah, it is. And, uh, and they were having this phone call, and in typical uh, UFO John Peel, all of those kinds of fashion, the communication was uh, interrupted on one side with, uh, <clears throat> with one of these scientists uh, not hearing anything but, uh, you know, static interruption. And then on the other side, uh, the scientist hearing this uh, really bizarre uh, voice. And uh, so he had, he had it analyzed at this place that I can't pronounce, uh, which is why we have to interview them so slowly because the English is tough. But uh, and so he had it analyzed, and basically the the, uh, the voice analysis uh, conclusion is you know it doesn't appear human, doesn't appear to be synthetic. Certainly could be synthetic. So unfortunately, like most paranormal things, it's uh, although it can't be explained, you know, who, who knows what that means. But, uh, so we'd like to play it for you anyhow, so I thought it's a pretty cool, uh, call. Uh, I don't know if you can click on that, Susan. Yeah, there you go. Uh, this is, uh, so this is in the call, and then you'll hear the interference, and then the voice comes. so. It's, uh... Can you hear it? I can't hear it. Yeah. So 
Did you hear it at all? No. Oh. Um, what does it say? Oh, what does it say? It's a pretty, uh, I would only describe it as it sounds like a disgusting, monstrous kind of voice. Uh, you know, the, the words are hard to make out. Dr. Toriello uh, believes it, uh, it says we are the project. Um, kind of sounds like that to me, but of course I read what he thought it said before I was able to play it. But, uh, you know, it's, it's like those things that I'm not really sure, but it certainly sounded really, really weird. You know? uh, and like I said, really, I guess I would only equate it to sound like it, like it's some sort of monster talking. <laughs> Not exorcist wise, you know, but uh, but very strange. I'm not. Uh, uh, yeah. So, well, we'll, we'll have to move on. It's weird because when I tested it, it worked. But anyhow. We didn't test it on the sound systems. Ah, yes. All right, so so like So uh, here's one that we consider in the category of. Time slips. Uh, well, I heard my boyfriend die over the phone. And this was uh, Cheryl Phillips in 2002 in Charlevoix, uh, Michigan. And she lived in an apartment building that previously was a uh, nursing home and slash asylum. You know, you see where this is going. And uh, this was part of a larger apartment building that was, uh, was haunted. There was Sounds of feet dragging, wheezing, uh, noises of all kinds, and uh, neighbors, upstairs neighbors complaining of the noise, of very, very loud noise and banging from downstairs and vice versa, yet it's quiet on each end. And, um, and so it had its, uh, you know, they knew it was a haunted place. And a boy from Joe, his, his apartment was there, and Cheryl was leaving her apartment to go uh, see Joe. And as she's on her way, uh, Joe receives a call from her phone. And, you know, this is a landline, you know, back in, back in those days, although they did, they did start having a big one. So, um, so from her apartment, there's a phone call to Joe. He picks it up and he hears the sound of what he can only describe to her as himself breathing on this respirator. Uh, and he instinctively feels this uh, feeling of fear and dread and he knows that he's dying. And uh, one of the things we found in the time slip category of phantom messages is uh, people hear noises that you normally would just discredit to whatever wrong number or uh, if you heard screaming, you know, somebody's got a TV on. But when it's this kind of phantom message, the reaction is uh, like people instinctively know what they're hearing is not normal and, or that it's real and not just a TV or something else. It's a different kind of experience just by their automatic reaction. Uh, and so he records this, and Cheryl gets there and says, I got this really bizarre phone call. And he, uh, he plays it for her. And she, without him even saying what it's about or what he thinks, uh, she has that same feeling of dread, like she's hearing from a, a real person. Now, granted, she knows that place is haunted uh, and has phenomena, but, uh, but this really felt different. Didn't feel like a normal noise or normal kind of thing. And uh, Joe's in perfect health, but uh, about a month later he died of some, some massive heart attack. And, uh, um, and uh, 
So she believes uh, that that is what she heard, that she heard him uh, dying over the phone from a phone call that came from her uh, empty apartment. Very scary. Very scary. Jack Freeze was only 32 when he suffered an unexpected fatal heart attack. He died in June of 2011. And his obituary described him as a man who could make you laugh even on your worst day, and uh, he was known for a sense of humor. So everything was quiet after his death for about five months, and then the emails started. In November, his best friend Tim Hart was confused when he saw a new email in his inbox but it was, uh, the sender was his good friend, Jack Freeze. The subject of the email read, I am watching. The text of the email said, Do you hear me? I'm at your house. Clean your effing attic. Tim remembered the last time Jack visited, they were hanging out in his attic, and Jack was telling him what a mess it was. And Tim Hart wasn't the only one who received this type of email from Jack that November. Jack's cousin Jimmy, Jimmy McGraw that is, also received a strange email in November. Um, the sender, again, is uh, cousin Jack Freeze. The subject heading read, Hey Jim. The text read, How are you doing? I knew you were going to break your ankle. I tried to warn you, you gotta be careful. Tell Rock, who's another friend of theirs, hi for me. His email didn't work. Apparently, Jack tried to email Rock also. The um, possibilities we um, thought of for this kind of phenomenon was uh, someone accessed Jack's emails and, and sent these, but why was, what would the reason be? Or maybe uh, Jack set up his emails to be sent later. And then, even if he did, he predicted his cousin would break his ankle five months later after his unexpected heart attack. Another possibility, did Jack discover a way to communicate with his friends from beyond the grave? <laughs> Thank you. Oh boy. <laughs> Take a break. Hey <laughs> Ben. This is very Go back. Go to another one. Go to another one. But the next time you might get next time. Okay. A lot of people ask, how do you get started? And I like asking people, what was their first experience that they might consider paranormal? And uh, so people, people ask me, so I made this to answer that question. Uh, this is little Jimmy, uh, about 10 years old. And my mother was having a friend over, and they said, Jimmy, um, I have a friend over, we're in the kitchen. Go stay up in the room. Um, I, I, I was a very dirty little kid, I dressed in a vampire and set to my uh, toy box in a coffin with a cape and my arms crossed and all that, so I was an embarrassment, so I should stay in your room. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, so I go up to my room, and I, I it wasn't, like, like I said, it wasn't a, uh, you know, it was a little room, it wasn't dark or anything, it was like 7 o'clock at night, and I remember I was listening to a, a, there was a Mets game on the radio, we had an AM radio. And I tried to recreate it as good as I could, it had a dial um, for tuning, and there was a volume one on the side, I remember. So I was listening to the game, and the radio started changing channels, stations by itself. <laughs> And even as a kid, I had a reason that said, well, you know, it's some, some kind of interference or something. You know, so. But then I, I looked up to see, you could see the amazement on my face. I saw the dials moving physically on the radio. So what I remember my mother said, Jimmy, stay in the room. So I don't want to know, I want to make that. See my feet up here? Yeah. That's what I had this picture done uh, uh, months ago, and I said something's wrong with this, it's just not right. And I realized I put my feet out the wrong way. And they went this way. <laughs> We've all put our feet out. So I fixed it, but I don't know. 
but I let them meet in their fault. So, um, so anyways, I remember my mother said, we're not going upstairs. So what am I going to do? The radio shipping station by itself. I'm panicking. And something threw my legs down on the bed really hard. So this is the next scene. No, but yep. <laughs> I ran downstairs. <laughs> and this is really funny because my mother's going to come to my first uh, speaking thing next week. And she's actually going to see these. Uh, <laughs> and she's really nice. Um, I said, Mom, Mom. There's a ghost in my room. It changed the stations. It threw my legs down. I don't know what to do. Just did it get back up in your bed. There's also sinister ghosts. And didn't everybody have this picture in your house? This uh, crayon loaf of bread. And I just wanted to go back upstairs. And that's, uh, they just, there's no such thing. And I said, that's probably why I'm still doing this. Forty years later. <laughs> oh, Bill <the> Hall's turn. <laughs> Uh, okay, this is another uh, time slip one. Uh, those are kind of my favorite. Now, of course, we all know that it, it appears, at least has some of those characteristics that makes you think that. And uh, this happened to David Fritz. Uh, he's in uh, Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And uh, he was an alcohol and substance abuse counselor and uh, received this uh, phone call went straight to his voicemail. Of course, he's always immediately, uh, you know, checking his phone for things. And, uh, and this was about a month before 9-11. And uh, he gets his message his voicemail. And uh, he can't see a number or, or, or you know, where it's from or anything, uh, or even a time on it. It was weird, he said. And uh, he played it, it was exactly three minutes. And he uh, felt very nauseous, sick, completely full of dread. He felt like it was a real terrifying event happening. And what he heard was uh, uh, wind and cra crashing metal and uh, screams uh, in the background. And uh, he knew there was something very different about this phone call. Now, normally, if you got a call and there were people screaming or whatever and you're listening to it, you, I would have thought, oh, somebody left TV on and wouldn't say, oh, this is a paranormal time slip event happening or something. <laughs> you know, but he felt this was very strange. So he played it for his girlfriend not to say, listen to this frightening call, just, hey, I get this weird message, you know, take a listen to it. And she also, reacted uh, in a way that instantly he said he should react like he did, that this was something very different. Uh, which, is, which, is, which is a common, uh, you know, commonality that we found you know, with these kinds of cases. So we played it for, for some friends too, and actually one of the ladies uh, ran out of the room and couldn't even listen to the message. Uh, so he's getting these calls every morning, he's getting these calls, exactly three minutes long, going right to his voicemail with those same metal clashing and screaming sounds. And he's like, well, this is really annoying. So he goes and he changes his cell phone, his phone number, and his cell service. And finally, all the calls stop until 9-11. About an hour before the towers fall, he gets one last call to his new number, his new phone, his new carrier, came right through the exact same three-minute message, and then he saw and heard um, the, the towers fell. And uh, he said, you know, just like you, who could say coincidence or prank or, or what, you know, who could say, but he said, I'll tell you, what it felt like was, was very real and very connected to that. So that's why we call it that, and I thank him for sharing that with us. I think you see that after. No, no, no calls after that. <clears throat> so, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the connection between uh, kind of some of the critters and uh, UFOs in a very interesting case uh, by witnesses that I came across very surprisingly. Uh, it was 
my college uh, fraternity brother and his wife, and I've known them since 1982, and all of a sudden I hear something about trolls while we're working on phantom messages, and I'm like, whoa, whoa. And uh, so it really is, it's satisfying when you actually know the people who are telling you a story, so you know, hey, yeah, everybody can argue misinterpretation or whatever, but at least you got the fourth part out of the way. But, uh, but in the old days, of course, uh, we have uh, the startup, we have the fairy legend, we have uh, the changelings, and of course trolls, which were known to be either very, very big, or uh, could be very tiny. Uh, if they're very big, they change the stone and the light, which is why they have Easter Island for everybody knows that. But, uh, and there's also the, the tiny ones. And uh, they would either have one head, two head, or three heads, uh, sometimes appearing on top of each other at the heads. And uh, like the fairy legend, uh, and like the UFO, uh, things that we see, uh, their favorite thing was uh, stealing cows. Uh, now, we don't know if that's just, if that's related to UFOs or if this is just a commonality in all the war because what other thing of value could creatures steal? Uh, but cows, and of course, children. Like, we've got to steal the children. And, uh, and the changeling lore is uh, very fascinating because there's, about, there's some very um, intriguing cases about it. Uh, but at the same time, it's a wonderful way to get rid of a really ugly, deformed, or problematic baby. <laughs> I got this baby, something's wrong with it. Hey, let's go trade with your baby. This is cute. Well, we can't do that. Yeah, yeah, we just say the changeling is for you know. <laughs> So that, you know, they would, that's a good way to get rid of a baby with some sort of mental illness that certainly would have appeared like a freak back then, um, or a curse. And so we have, as everything in the paranormal, uh, that creates an, an extra layer of difficulty. But uh, in this case of trolls, uh, it was uh, Stacy who I've known since 1982, says, oh yeah, you're right, you're a normal book. Man, I'll never forget those trolls. And I'm like, what? Well, so what happened was, uh, when she was growing up, she was living in a three-family home, and they were on the top floor of her and her brother. It was the attic floor. There was two bedrooms and a chimney that came up uh, with windows to the outside where the, you could see the chimney and everything. And uh, Stacy woke up one night to uh, a bunch of scratching sounds. And she went over and looked out and saw carrying uh, behind the chimney, the little arm, she saw three heads on top of each other. And uh, she described them very similar to everything you read, even in the oldest of, and again, we're not saying, we're using the term trolls, you know, to equate it to little entities, because I don't like to be that specific, but. Uh, her brother called them goblins, but trolls seem to be fascinating because especially with the similarity of what we've seen. But, um, so she described them as really little, uh, little creatures that were extremely ugly, wrinkly skin, extremely ugly. She didn't have a lot of detail about ears or eyes. Uh, she just knew that they were unbelievably ugly. And, uh, so, of course, she was quite scared and had trouble sleeping. Uh, she never knew her brother actually saw that. It was, um, they had moved from that house, um, and there was two other houses involved. But, uh, so right there, it was the two children that saw it, neither one spoke about it, until years later. And uh, Stacy said, you know, Mark, if you, you know, have you ever, see anything weird or whatever. And he goes, oh, you've seen those ugly little things too? And uh, in the house there were these eaves. And uh, when they, uh, later on, Stacy would have to, well, she'd have to go buy these eaves that, that had little storage things. She'd have to go buy them to get to her room. 
And uh, she saw them open the thing up and peek out with other ones behind her. And um, so it was, she was quite scared, a lot of problems, of course, you know, the parents can't go to bed, that type of thing. So they moved uh, to another house. Uh, again, they're on the attic floor. And uh, Stacy doesn't know it at the time, but her younger sister, uh, Roxanne, is having some problems with trolls. Uh, and she's having the problems at the new place. Same creatures. And they're dragging her uh, out of her bed and trying to grab, uh, put her in one of these uh, eaves because the, the other house had eat things too. Convenient for the little creatures. And uh, that's one rend rendition of the <laughs> trolls, in the, even though she couldn't tell how the ears look. But. And so they're dragging little Roxanne off the bed, trying to get her into the eaves. And she's shaking loose every time. This happened about three times. And she managed to shake loose every time, and then they would scramble back into the eaves and shut the door. They didn't make any noise at all, she said, except for the doors and stuff open. And um, there was now the third house, when they moved again to house family home, they were on the second floor, there were no eaves and stuff, there was just a closet. And again, they came, there were several of them that uh, came out at once. And uh, she was quite scared. They almost got her this time. Uh, but she ran over for free, and they all went into the closet and closed the door. And uh, what was fascinating is during uh, the experience of uh, interviewing uh, Stacy and stuff, and then later the guy just said, hey, I want to talk to your parents, see if they know and stuff. And it turns out that they knew about this, and that's why they moved. And uh, so the parents knew. Uh, Stacy saw him, her brother saw him, her little sister not only saw him, but was dragged out of the bed a total of four times by these whatever creatures. And I would say it's completely crazy if I haven't known Stacy and Tony since 1982. Uh, it's they're very strange. Uh, and what's even stranger is we just discovered a new case like this. <laughs> it's like, I mean, there's more of these, you know? Yeah. So uh, that might be in our next one. And that's the actual uh, troll house. The other thing Jimmy and I want to do is we really want to see if any other uh, inhabitants of these houses have had have seen anything like this. Uh, what I did find was interesting is just like the troll lore and the fairy lore, uh, it had the, the notion of following, you know, the family. So maybe they just wanted to be part of the family. Who knows? And now Jimmy. All right, this um, was 1952. And little Jack Sarfati, who's pictured here in the present, was 13 years old, living in an apartment in the Bronx. He was reading a book on computer circuits, and the phone rang. Jack answered and heard a strange sequence of mechanical sounds. Then an odd metallic voice came through the line. The voice sounded kind of mechanical and gave Jack a series of numbers that he didn't understand. The voice said, Jack, this is a conscious computer that is aboard a spacecraft. Jack was told he had been selected to be one of 400 young, receptive minds to be part of a special project, but Jack had to make the decision himself. The eerie voice told him he would begin to meet others that he would work with 20 years in the future, but he had to agree to it. Jack wanted to slam the phone down and say no, but he felt a jolt of electricity Go up his spine all the way to the base of his skull, and Jack shouted, yes. Poor old Jack was terrified. The voice on the other line said, good. Now go into the fire escape, and we're going to send a spaceship to pick you up in about 10 minutes. Jack called all his old friends on the phone. The aliens called me up, they're sending a spacecraft for me in 10 minutes. Come over. 
<laughs> and the one is for street press. <laughs> the spaceship never came. But years later, Jack's mother reminded him, remember all those strange calls you got as a kid? And Jack said, oh, I only got that one phone call. His mom said, no, 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 you got those calls for over three weeks and you were walking around all glassy-eyed. And then she confessed that she became so concerned about these phone calls that she listened in on one of them and she heard the same cold, mechanical, alien-sounding voice. She told the voice, stop bothering my son and stop calling. And the call stopped after that. But those calls changed Jack's life and work Jack became a famous quantum physicist, came up with a theory that the universe was created in the future, and uh, Jack's theories have been used in the movies The Terminator, Judgment Day, and it's believed that he was the influence for the character Emmett Brown, the uh, time-traveling doctor in the movie Back to the Future. Do you have something else to say about the Jack? Oh, yeah. Uh, the, uh, the conscious computer had told him that in 20 years, you know, if he says yes, I'll be part of this, um, I don't think they use the word think tank, but for, that's the easy way to say it. And uh, it was 20 years in the future where he became part of a, uh, if you Google it, it's, it's kind of a famous little group of uh, modern physicists. And uh, Jack Sarfati isn't any physicist. He's credited with uh, inventing quantum science. And today he studies uh, artificial intelligence and consciousness. That's how much those phone calls uh, influence his life. And uh, so it's, uh, he's a physicist physicist. Not that you have to agree with all his theories. I'm sure all physicists don't. But uh, it is fascinating the way his future turned out. Uh, based on the 20 year mark and based on what the phone calls had told me. So, Sam, uh, we're almost out of time. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, maybe put it this time. Do we have time for yeah, that? Yeah, we have time. See if we have a creepy kid. Please, creepy kid, sorry. Yeah, it's too long. <laughs> Is there anybody in the audience that would help me um, with this audience participation? Sure. Just read a couple of lines. Sure. You want me to bring it to you? Me? Mm -hmm. Anyone? Sure. <laughs> yeah, give me John. Give me the John. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, I'll preface this. this is, I do a, a radio program called The Hudson Chronicles, and I, I have guests on, and I sometimes just talk about a random subject that I want to talk about. And I was thinking uh, one week how creepy kids are. Like, there's one of the scariest movies, it's a little kid that seems to be the center of attention. Shining, uh, Children of the Corn, Omen, Exorcist, The Orphan, and all that. So I, I mean, I'm scared of a little kid standing next to my bed and while you're sleeping more than somebody running at me with a hatchet for some reason. <laughs> so anyways, I started researching, uh, I, I started researching creepy kids, and I found this whole string of um, creepy, things little kids say to their parents. So I, uh, where's my assistant? Me? Yeah. yeah. I have some uh, quotes from parents that these are creepy things that their kids said. Okay, I hand them all off. You hand them off? I hand them all off, yes. Okay, go ahead, anybody. What do you want, do you want to do the response? Uh, just read them, read them. Read it out loud? Yeah. Oh, can you guys read them? Oh, stand up and read them out loud at the microphone. Oh, I just got it. Okay, this is number seven. Okay. It's called Reincarnating. Uh, a kid and his parents were walking past the old cemetery, and the three year old son casually said, My brother's a man. When I reminded him that he didn't have a brother, he said, No, mom, from before, when the other lady was my mom. Holy man. Oh, what well, is going on? Okay, go ahead. When my son was young, I was talking to him about growing potatoes. I described how you, I can't read that to me. Forget that word. And, uh, yeah. You got uh, something of the earth around them as they grow, all the amount of the earth as they grow. He said, I know, I used to do that when I was 
an old man. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, creepy. some of these examples are like the possible reincarnation. Do you think they got worse? We got more. Oh, man. There you go. My daughter handed me a flower and said, Here, Mom, here's a flower for your grave. <laughs> <laughs> and, Daddy, I want to cut off your head and carry it around with me so I can see you all the time. It's <laughs> creepy, right? Creepy. Okay, this one is two Barbie doll stories. My five-year-old daughter says, Mom, I need you to throw away two of my Barbies. Mom asks why, because they look back at me. When I was four, my mom found me in the bathroom with all my Barbie dolls floating face down in the bath. When she asked what I was doing, I replied, the man in the wardrobe told me if I didn't do it, it would be my turn to swim face down. <laughs> I think they would be worse. While saying goodnight to his two-year-old son, the two-year-old says goodbye, Dad. The dad says, no, we say goodnight. And the two-year-old says, I know, but this time it's goodbye. Holy <laughs> And then um, my three-year-old daughter stood next to her newborn brother and looked at me and said, Daddy, it's a monster. We should bury it. Thank you. There's more? This is Creepy Kids 3. My daughter was three and I was getting ready for the day. She had been waking up with nightmares almost every night for a month or two. I asked her what she wanted for breakfast. She told me she wanted to share it with the dead baby in her closet. I thought she meant one of her dolls, but when I pulled all the dolls out, she said, no, not a doll, the dead one that sleeps on the closet floor at night. <laughs> Creepy Kids 4. While changing my daughter in front of an open closet door, she kept looking around me and laughing. I asked, what's so funny? She said, this, she said the man. I said, what man? She then pointed to the closet and said, the man with the snake neck right there. I turned around and nothing was there. The man with the snake neck. Yes. Wow. Is that all of them? Not yet. Do you have one more? I do. It's not on your list, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, my youngest son was sleeping in our bed for months, and he wouldn't get out. And when I finally confronted him, he said to me, and I quote, I'm afraid to sleep in my bed. I'm afraid the aliens will come and take me through the window again. The word again is what got me. Yeah, again. Again. So I don't see a phone conference if you're going to throw that in, but no. Yeah. So, <laughs> Thank well, you for your story. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I'll just wander in the time. Yeah. <laughs> go, go sit on his table back there, Mark Dillon. Tell me. Mark is a man, so I don't know. Again. Is that all for uh, creepy kids? All right. And please, pass your sheets forward at the end of class. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you.